Your Excellency, Dr. Bhaskar Chatterjee, Mr. Seth, Ms. Librizi. It's my great privilege to welcome you to ILM's third international conference on responsible management, education, training, and practice. ILM mission focuses on a deep commitment to sustainable development and green environment and an appreciation of cultural heritage of socio-economic diversity of India. ILM became a signatory of PRME in 2008 and has been actively engaged in implementing initiatives and framework of PRME and UN Global Compact. We have embedded the principles of responsible management education in our curricula, research, pedagogy, and student experience. At the UN Global Leadership Forum in New York in September 2013, ILM was inducted as a champion business school among 22 business schools across the world and only one from India. At ILM, in our limited way, we continuously channelize our efforts towards communicating and creating awareness of these issues, embedding right values, sharing knowledge, and engaging with individuals from companies, NGOs, governments, educational institutions, and other sectors of society in finding solutions for sustainability and sustainable development goals. So we would also like to share with you that ILM has been very active in area of executive education also. We are one of the very few institutions in India which have been conducting short-time in-service programs for IAS and IPS officers as per mandate of Department of Personal and Training Government of India since 2004. Uh, we also conduct regular programs for leading public sector enterprises, as well as leading private sector companies. In fact, uh, we have uh, trained almost 350 executives of IBM for their upgradation into managerial credit over a period of three and a half years. In terms of students, sustainability, experiential learning, and global exposure have been made an integral part of ILM student experience for the past two years. All our postgraduate students and most of our undergraduate students spend between four weeks to one semester studying in a foreign institution. We also invite a large number of foreign faculty members from Europe, Canada, USA to come and teach our students for a full course. And our basic focus is to develop students as responsible, socially sensitive, and globally aware members of society who are able to contribute towards international development and transmit rich and deep-rooted values to the rest of the world. So faculty development is a critical component for building capabilities of students as future generators of sustainable values. As a co-lead of the PRME Champions Project on Faculty Development, ILM has been actively working with Babson College USA and Copenhagen Business School Denmark to develop special faculty development programs. Uh, we strongly believe what Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon for changing the world. So we believe that we all business schools, not only us, have a very critical role to play in developing right values and embedding sustainability in our students. We realize that we cannot make the world a better place to live unless we accept the differences of the people of the world and find out the optimum path through dialogue. No matter how small or big your contribution, it makes a difference. 
One of the key objectives of this conference is to create awareness of SDGs among companies, policymakers, NGOs, and to initiate activities for focus on SDG-related issues in business school courses and initiatives. Sir, so I would also take this opportunity to uh, recognize the primary force behind our uh, involvement in PRME and United Nations SDG, our chairman, Mr. Anil Rai, who has been uh, continuously giving unstinted support to make this venture in Ireland success. So we are very grateful to you. Uh, I would quickly run through the program. In this session, we have uh, four luminaries with us. We have His Excellency, Mr. Kozlowski. We also have Dr. Bhaskar Chatterjee, Director General and CEO, Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. We have Mr. Nitin Seth, Managing Director, Fidelity Worldwide Investments, and Ms. Florencia Labrizzi from UN Global Compact, New York. Uh, before I uh, request His Excellency to deliver his address, I would just like to share his background with you. Mr. His Excellency Mr. Koloski is Ambassador of European Union to India and Bhutan. Prior to his posting in New Delhi, he served as Ambassador of the European Union to the Republic of Korea from 2011 to 2015. During his tenure, he played a crucial role in the implementation of European Union Korea Free Trade Agreement. Since 2004, he has been working for the European Union in Brussels as head for Asia at the Office of EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, and later as principal advisor for Asia and Latin America at the European Commission. Before joining the European Union, His Excellency was a member of the Polish Diplomatic Service. He was posted at the Polish embassies in Indonesia and Malaysia. He also served as ambassador of Poland to Pakistan in 2001 to 2003. And he was director general for Asia at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Warsaw in 2003, 2004. Uh, he has also worked for United Nations in Cambodia and South Africa. His publications include book chapter on development cooperation, security issues, and European Union Asia relations. Sir, so we are really honored to have you with us. Now, may I request you to kindly deliver your keynote address. Professor Chaudhry, distinguished guests, participants from the academia, from the public sector, from the private sector. I'm really uh, honored to be invited for this important and interesting gathering. Uh, while the title of this seminar is called Responsible Management Education, Training and Practice, I understand that this is, in other words, part of a campaign to raise awareness about the recently adopted Sustainable Development Goals, why they matter for the world, and particularly for India, including for its business community. I would try to give to you a European perspective on Sustainable de Development Goals, and I believe that here many of you will share my assessment. That's why let's start with, uh, uh, I will start with a few words on the Agenda 2030 and as, uh, SDGs, what they are, why are they important, and why it, this is a paradig paradigm shift in the international community. Both the European Union and India have been very active in the United Nations over the last years to develop a new paradigm for development, a blueprint 
for a development that is sustainable for both developed and developing countries alike and focusing and helping the most vulnerable. This was called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with an ambitious set of 17 sustainable development goals and 169 associated targets. The agenda sets out a global framework to eradicate poverty and achieve sustainable development by 2030. It was adopted by the United Nations in September in New York in the presence of more than 150 heads of states and governments, including those from India, from the European Union, and its member states. The 2030 Agenda and its SDGs built on the Millennium Development Goals, so-called and very famous MDGs, that were adopted in 2000, but progress towards the MDGs had not been uneven around the world, and not all targets were reached. I had the honor to be present in New York in 2000 during the Millennium Summit, and that time I felt this atmosphere of hopes from all leaders from all around the world that MDGs would make a change. And of course, we have achieved a lot since 2000, but now we have new challenges and we decided all together as the United Nations and all stakeholders uh, at the international community to deal with these challenges in a bit different way. The main difference between the MDGs uh, adopted in 2000 and SDGs uh, adopted last year uh, can be described as integration. Why? The Agenda 2030 integrates what was previously done under two separate tracks. The poverty eradication track, following up on the MDGs and the Millennium Summit, and the sustainable development track following up on the Rio conferences and Agenda 2020. Now there is one comprehensive global framework on poverty and sustainability. As a consequence, there is less fragmentation and competition of resources, because after all, they are about the same thing, improving the lives of our people especially the most vulnerable. In addition, there is another track on implementation that has also been integrated to the first one. We have adopted on the one hand, as I mentioned, the objective, global goals and targets on poverty eradication and sustainable development, but on the other hand, the way to reach this objective it means now the instruments to achieve such goals have been much better designed and have been much better uh, prepared. And one of the reasons why I'm so sure that the instruments have been better prepared, because in the financial instruments to support the sustainable development goals have been better designed. And this financial track of handling sustainability and sustainable development have been, uh, has been always, uh, as well integrated into the uh, whole exercise. Uh, the third dimension of the integration of the new agenda is that it has been develop, developing, taking into account the interlinkages between other, other global commitments, such as climate change, gender equality, health, or good governance, and many others. Another major novelty, indeed, was the adoption of, two, uh, of 2030 Agenda, uh, that this, the adoption was characterized by the unprecedented participation of civil society and other stakeholders. This exercise has been prepared, has been designed, and is going to be developed not only by the governments, not only by international organizations. 
in the process of preparing this agenda, so many stakeholders have participated, the governments, civil society, NGOs, and business community, the academia. It means that sometimes international meetings are extremely complicated, having up to 10,000 participants, like, for example, the last COP meeting in Paris. But the idea behind this to have all stakeholders on board to listen to them and to accommodate the uh, requests and um, uh, requirements. That's why my, uh, my understanding is that the new 2030 agenda is a game changer. It redefines how the international community works together on a global commitment to a different kind of future for people and the planet. To be more specific, the 17 new SDGs and associated targets balance the three dimension of sustainable development, environment, social, and economic ones. They are covering areas such as poverty, inequality, food security, health, sustainable consumption and production, growth, employment, infrastructure, sustainable management of natural resources, climate change, as well as gender equality, peaceful and inclusive societies, access to justice, and accountable, uh, accountable institutions. It means that the picture, the exercise, is extremely complex, not only, as I mentioned, from the point of view of so many participants and parties concerned and involved, but as well from the point of view of goals we have established. And now, what we do to implement these goals? What does the EU do? What should other countries and stakeholders do? Well, the EU has been a leader in contributing to the process from the start. It's now committed to take the agenda forward, both inside the EU and through the EU's external policies. Internally, we have already approved a big number of projects and concepts how to move this agenda forward, but uh, including through very new concept which is called new circular economy package, which is a completely new, uh, new concept for the European Union. And the basic uh, uh, element of this concept is how to effi effectively and efficiently use resources uh, for, uh, for the benefits of producers, businesses, and consumers. But of course, for, for, for you, for, for the uh, audience here, the more important is what the EU do externally. You may know that the European Union collectively, it means the European institutions and EU member states, are by far the largest provider of uh, development assistance. Only in 2014, we spent uh, more than 50 billion euros collectively uh, for development assistance to different countries. And our goal is to increase our share in the future, despite the fact as you are fully aware that the European Union now is going through a very difficult and complicated stage of, it, of it, its development. We have our own internal problems, external problems, but nevertheless, we subscribe to SDGs in New York last year and we are ready to deliver. And uh, as we are at the business school, it's important to underline that one of our objectives while providing our development assistance is to promote and to help the private sector in many developing countries to establish itself better and to contribute better to the economic and social development of the countries. But, of course, the implementation of SDGs is a, an objective or it's a task which is faced by, by all countries, by all stakeholders. And more than the government, uh, in addition to the governments, as I mentioned, 
uh, it will be underpinned by a global partnership uh, mobilizing action by other stakeholders, including the private sector. Private sector which should be responsible. And this leads me to the next and the last part of my address that will focus on the economic part, the business case for the SDGs. Because sometimes the business community is not fully aware what SDGs are and what uh, should be their role and what kind of opp opportunities are part of this concept. The EU and the international community are not involved in the whole global agenda just because it's the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do for our economy, for our envi environment, for our society. Because driving people out of poverty and ensuring a sustainable future means stronger economies, more markets, and more stable markets. It means more business for responsible private sector. This, uh, the increasing obligation for the European businesses on corporate and social responsibility eventually meet more business to satisfy better aware consumers. Business with global consumers will have to be increasingly responsible. And this is not just the European Union consumer. You can feel the consumer awareness here in India already. I think Indian consumer and Indian businesses are ready to take their shares in the movement, to a movement towards sustainability and responsibility. Also, because I will repeat it once again, it means more and better business. Since the seminar was called in the context of global efforts on corporate social responsibility, I cannot refrain from adding that the EU strongly believes in CSR, because CSR is critical for the sustainability, competitiveness and innovation of EU enterprises and the EU economy and the CSR is in the interest of the society as a whole. In the EU, we have adopted our own strategy on CSR and we are following closely and supporting all efforts of the EU Global Compact to develop and to disseminate uh, CSR principles all throughout the world. Indian companies, I believe, are increasingly developing the um, CSR policies too. Actually, this seminar is part of these efforts and we can only encourage this trend. Finally, and as a conclusion, I wanted to stress that Agenda 2030 and the SDGs are a common effort of the international community one in which both India and the European Union are key partners. We both have contributed a lot to the elaboration of the goals, negotiating nights and days at the United Nations, discussing a lot bilaterally to find final compromises acceptable to all. And we now are key partners also for its implementation in the world with our respective responsibilities and capabilities. This also means we can strengthen our bilateral cooperation, building on our ex excellent links and develop our work in India that serves the global goals and contribute to sustainable development in India. And in this uh, case, I would like to underline that now the European Union and India are working together on the very, very practical projects which will benefit, which will be beneficial to both sides. And at the same time, they, which, they will be based on each other priorities and uh, expectations. India now is very much uh, driven by so-called flagship projects 
like clean Ganga, water management, uh, making India uh, energy uh, efficiency, and so on and so on. And we, uh, and India, and the European Union, we are together working now uh, to what extent we can work together. And uh, not long ago, we uh, held here in Delhi so-called uh, Indo-European Water Forum. Now we are about to establish, uh, to formalize so-called Indo-European Water Platform, through which we will be working together on uh, water, on a Clean Ganga Initiative and water management in India. The European Union has uh, much to offer, offer, not only technologies, but certain legal and governance issues. As India, to some extent, is, uh, is a, cons uh, consists of 29 uh, states, the European Union consists of 28 member states. And when I met the President Mukherjee, he referred to you that on the basis of it, we can try to find certain uh, subjects for further cooperation. And such issues, are, as I mentioned, water management, uh, smart cities, uh, renewable energies, energy efficiency, uh, solar energy, and so on and so on. There are subjects on which we, as governments, and our business, uh, business communities can work together with benefits to both sides. And uh, I'm absolutely uh, sure that the European Union and India, being an important player at the international arena, we can deliver more together uh, as well uh, in relations to countries which need such assistance or help even more. That's why I was very much impressed by the recently held Africa-India summit uh, last November, where India committed itself to provide assistance to African countries. That's why, dear friends, uh, I, will, I will stop here, but before this I will make one uh, more comment. The subject is possible, uh, this is responsible management education, training in practice. And it was already mentioned by Professor Chowdhury to what extent education is important. I can tell you that uh, this is my absolute conviction on the basis of my long-term uh, stay in many developing countries. Education is uh, a key element for achieving our social and economic goals, including in the framework of sustainable uh, development, if not the key element. That's why the uh, handling properly education system is the key challenge for each government. And in this case, to make a link, uh, link between education system and business responsibility, this is something, this is a, a huge room for business community to be more engaged in promoting sustainable development goals at the state at the federal level, at the international level. Because, as I mentioned a few, few times during my talk, that this is in the interest, not only gener in general terms, but this is in the interest of purely, uh, purely e economic and business activity of the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for a very comprehensive and compact review of involvement of sustainable development goals, their significance in the coming times, and specifically with relation to European Union, what they have already done, and the value of education. So we really appreciate that, and uh, we are going to bring a special edition after this conference, and your speech will be an excellent component for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, friends, now I introduce uh, our next speaker, 
Ms. Florencia Lebrezzi. She's head of legal and policy at United Nations Global Compacts PRME Initiative. She is an attorney licensed in Argentina and New York State, USA. Uh, before she joined PRME, she worked at International Center for Transitional Justice and practiced law for seven years. Uh, one thing which I found <coughs> fascinating about her was that in addition to law, where she did her master's degree from New York University School of Law, one of the leading business uh, law schools in the, in the United States. She has graduated from the Conservatory of Music, and she is also a professor of piano. <laughs> she said uh, she started learning piano at the age of 11, and she has three pianos of different sophistication at her house. <laughs> At uh, New York University School of Law, she was granted the Dean's Award and distinguished as a Transitional Justice Scholar. She has served as a graduate editor for the New York University Journal of International Law and Politics and has published several articles and book chapters. Over to you, please. Thank you so much. Um, His Excellence, uh, Mr. Thomas Kowlowski, um, Dr. Bashkar Chatterjee, Mr. Nitin Seth, Dr. Rakesh Chowdhury, Mr. Anand Rai, distinguished speakers, professors, administrative staff, students, representative of businesses, government, and civil society, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Rakesh. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today with all of you and to be here for the next three days as well uh, in this very interesting and relevant conference on the SDGs. Um, on behalf of the UN Global Compact Principle for Responsible Management Education, uh, Prime Secretariat, I'd like to thank ILM, um, High Institution, uh, Institute for Higher Education, for its kind invitation. Uh, for this third international conference that brings a very attractive agenda and a very relevant one on the SDGs. Uh, I'd like to thank in particular Mr. Anand Rai, Dr. Rakesh Chaudhry, and his wonderful team for putting this very important event together. Um, my team uh, in New York, especially uh, Jonas Hartl, our head at the Prime Secretariat, um, wishes a very uh, successful meeting and send our, their kind regards. So today, I'd like to address some of the key issues that our society is facing um, on, and how management education can contribute uh, in this uh, landscape that we have and the, and the current challenges. So I'd like to um, stress two points. First, I'd like to take some minutes to reflect uh, why the UN, uh, United Nations, and in particular the UN Global Compact, uh, helped to launch the prime principles uh, in 2007. And secondly, and that will be an easy task after having ambassador to uh, talk about the SDGs in such a comprehensive way, um, I like to go to the SDGs in particular and see how we can, um, from the, not only the academic perspective, but also the, the private sector, can help to achieve the SDGs. So in this sense, um, we have seen over the past two decades a key development that has been this increasing consensus that business leaders and private sector organizations have a legitimate and also a crucial role to play along the side the political and civil society organizations uh, to embed sustainable development as a core principle guiding our societies. The UN Global Compact and other global, regional and local um, organizations have shown us this in particular We've seen, for instance, more than 8,000 uh, companies worldwide that have embraced the 10 principles of the Global Compact and have been striving to embed values of human rights, um, workplace standards, good environmental practices, and anti-corruption into the core operations. Um, we also uh, have seen that not only at the global le uh, level, but also at the regional one and local one, 
global compact local networks have been uh, been created, and many of, of them are present in these regions, such as in India, in Bangladesh, China, Malaysia, among others. So over the years, many stakeholders have identified the central role uh, that management and business schools also have in, on this. Um, and this is important because through the research, education activities, they can play an important role in equipping the next generation, and many of you uh, students are here as well, um, in creating uh, leaders for a sustainable future. So this is the reason why we think the Global Compact, uh, this was a call for more sustainability. You know, it's not about only integrating in the core operation sustainability, but also looking at the next generation. How we, can we have next generation of leaders that come with the mindset of sustainability? So the sustainable case, even for the Global Compact, what's bringing this initiative with Prime um, that focuses exactly on that, how management-related uh, institutions and business schools are teaching and researching on these issues. So more than 650 higher education institutions at this point in the world, and we have many more uh, to get on board, have already signed to Prime, and they're participating in many working groups, regional chapters, and the champion program as at ILM. Together with our partners, including business schools, um, uh, uh, business school accreditation organizations like AACSB, EFMD, AMBA, and, and many others, we are encouraging you to take further actions to embedding the prime principles in your curriculum and research activities. So management schools have a social function in society by educating the corporate leaders of tomorrow. Prime addresses this uh, social dimension in the four principles uh, by placing the principles of corporate sustainability at the heart of business school, business education, uh, curriculum, methodology, learning frameworks, and research. However, that, does this social role of business schools go beyond these dimensions? We think so. Um, and, and Prime has these additional two principles, which are partnership and dialogue. So according to the principle five, business schools should partner with companies to explore effective ways to meet social environmental challenges. This is further expanded by principle six, where business schools are invited to address, along with relevant stakeholders in society, critical issues related to global sustainability. It follows from these two principles that business schools have another dimension so far quite underdeveloped to develop their potential to partnerships and social impact in the field of social and environmental challenges and global sustainability. We call this the four dimensions of PRIME. So in order to fully develop these four dimensions of PRIME, which comes from the mandate and the principles, so business schools now have a historical opportunity um, to contribute uh, to the global sustainability agenda, which is the UN 2030 development agenda, in particular the sustainable development goals. So let's take a moment to reflect, and I think Ambassador has already set up here a good um, stage. So we have now the, in the recently launched SDGs, which provide a powerful aspiration. As our new executive director, Lisa Kingo, says, there are some sort of lighthouse that show us the direction in which we want to go. As also Ambassador pointed out very nicely, this integration world that goes in three dimensions, in terms of integrating the topics. We know that it's not about education, poverty, they all built on each other, and it's very important to tackle in, a, in, in that sense, although we also know that depending on the context, and, and we have seen also in this agenda, there are some SDGs that they are more uh, maybe a priority than others. We probably don't have to, you know, that each context will have a different approach, and that's fine. That's why they're national, um, um, plans are going to take care of. We know that implementation is key and is, and is crucial. Uh, it's, it's already a, a huge, um, um, you know, um, accomplishment that we have been able to launch the SDGs, but this is now starting. We've only been seven days since uh, its official, um, well, what it was already launched. It is um, valid now since 1st January. So we have a huge tax um, beyond uh, and, and ahead of us. Um, we also uh, said that, yes, this was agreed 
and by 193 UN states and uh, member states, also involving businesses, civil societies, um, and citizens uh, from the outset. So this is all quite important, but now, as we, go to, as we move to implementation, we need all governments to show strong political support, and also it becomes very clear that the goals will only be achieved through co-investment and collaboration of all stakeholders. So multilateral institutions, public authorities, companies, civil society, academia. So what does it mean for us? And I think, you know, Ambassador again has talked about the relevance for business and business schools. And I'm going to move, is it? Yeah, okay, so we'll use this. So I don't have to, uh, this is just a few points on why they're relevant. And again, I think Ambassador again uh, said something very important, which is both um, the importance of uh, acting responsibly and finding opportunity. And I think here there's a key um, word for businesses and business schools. And often we know that business schools are also businesses, right? But I think um, here is important in terms of how, first of all, we're trying to do not, on, not only what is right, what is moral, what is correct, but also, again, what is smart, and we have a strong business case. And many of us, we all often feel that we are an exception because some things are not yet main, mainstream, right? Well, here we have a strong case to show that what we're doing is the right path. And this, I think, is going to help uh, the task of many of you. So here in this chart um, that I put, um, I, make, I try to make a parallel between businesses and higher education institutions because obviously uh, business schools and management related institutions are supporting the work of businesses, especially those that they're responsible, that we are, that's what we are advocating. So SDGs can help define the future of business opportunities, can enhance the, enhance the business case for sustainable business practice, allow better stakeholder engagement, and strengthen the enable business uh, environment for businesses. And on the side of the um, academics, we know academics are helping because they're already teaching those businesses. So we are giving future businesses leaders the tool to recognize those opportunities. So basically we are teaching how to act responsible, and we're also teaching how to find that opportunity. And this is key. This is very important. On the other hand, um, let's see. Well, it's also very important how we start setting our goals explicitly aligned to the SDGs. There's a lot of work that um, many responsible businesses and academics are doing already on the SDGs. Um, you know, now we have the framework of the SDGs to actually even give it a stronger push. Um, but it's important to explicitly align them to the SDGs for many reasons. One of these is for the business case. But also, as, as we create those, um, those uh, goals, we create, we're creating a, a vision um, and a shared goal to move forward, which also help us uh, in terms of um, identifying uh, those aspirations, priorities across the institution, and uh, it's an important tool for driving, monitoring, and communicating the progress. So I think that chart um, speaks about the different processes and steps that we're probably going to move for the next point. So, so here, as I mentioned before, Prime and Global Compact, they're both global platforms that provide a framework to advance on these issues, as well as many resources and engagement opportunities that you will see in the slides. I don't want to take much time on this, but I also would like to move to resources. There are many resources available that you, I like it. you can check out, and how uh, businesses and business schools can advance and contribute uh, on the SDGs. But I do want to take more time. And for instance, this is the SDG Compact. It's a very important one as well, because it goes very concretely on the different SDGs and the different targets. So I highly encourage you to see that if you haven't yet. Um, yes, but just to, to go to a concrete level of how prime business schools can contribute, I'd like to point out at the two different levels. One is at the individual level, and the other one is at the collective level. So at the individual level, um, it's important to align your education, research, and engagement agendas with the issues articulated at the UN Sustainable Development Goals Framework. 
embed new content and, content and transformative learning approaches, including experiential learning, throughout the curriculum in order to develop um, the competencies necessary for business to tackle our major, major sustainable development goals. Engage in new forms of action research. This is very important, and we've been talking about this with Rakesh. There's often a, a huge gap between businesses and academics, you know, and we see that. I'm very pleased to see how ILM is working so closely with, a, with, a, with a businesses because there's a, a mutual need and benefit of working together. We need more applied research, and we need more of this experiential learning from students from early ages, so this is very important. Um, we also need to play an active role as public opinion leaders, advisors, solution providers and facilitators to help business to become an effective ag agent of sustainable development. And I think academics are very well equipped to do that and to um, have that agent uh, role. And also act as an impartial facilitators between businesses, governments and civil society, especially as the national plans um, get developed to support the SDGs. On the other hand, at the collective level, and I think here is, is key, the work that you can do with the Global Compact and with Prime as a global um, community in both, in both platforms. And an important step will be to connect and collaborate with the chapters of Prime and the Global Compact local networks in your region, host events and webinars such as this one, which I hope it will be productive for all of you, conduct training meetings, to help participants understand how they can contribute to the SDGs, participate in the national government plans in your country, define local priorities based on the SDGs, and again, we call business schools to express their leadership, and we hope that the prime initiative, you know, with extensive community and very vibrant um, community around the world, can help you to scale up your efforts. Um, Prime is a comparative young initiative. We um, are about to celebrate this year the ninth anniversary. And as such, we're still developing as well uh, toward our full potential. Um, not only at the participant institutional level, in which we see that they're improving, but also as an industry as a whole. Uh, so the SDGs means a challenge, a big one. And, uh, as, as Ambassador also pointed out, there is this ambitious set of goals, but we couldn't wait anything different than that. You know, we couldn't imagine anything different because the reality is a challenging one. We still need to do a lot to, to, if we really go, we're going to get this sustainable world that we all deserve and want. But this is also a new and wonderful opportunity to become pioneers in the fulfillment of one of the most ambitious and crucial tasks of our times to partner with the UN and other stakeholders to attain global sustainability by 2030. Again, I'm very delighted to be with you for the next three days to engage with productive uh, conversation. I also look forward to uh, hear from all of you, to have a, a dialogue that is productive for everyone. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much to the host for uh, very kind hospitality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Florencia, uh, for giving a quick overview of uh, BRME's framework for SDGs. Uh, friends, now we are. Next speaker is Dr. Bhaskar Chatterjee. He's uh, Director General and CEO of the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, a think tank and a center of excellence for governance and CSR set up by Ministry of Corporate Affairs. He graduated from Hindu College, Delhi University, and did his master's from St. Stephen's College. Dr. Chatterjee joined Indian Administrative Service in 1975. That's a long time ago. <laughs> and has held many distinguished positions during his illustrious career. He has been Secretary, Public Sector Enterprises, Government of India. In 2008-2009, he was Principal Advisor in the Planning Commission. 
He was also a key member of the team responsible for shaping India's response to global economic crisis in 2009. He is a widely acclaimed management practitioner, theorist, and a great teacher. Uh, and he fulfills a very critical role in implementation of SDGs. As Ambassador pointed out, for successful implementation of SDGs, private sector has a very big role to play. And Dr. Bhaskar Tejiri is probably one of the strongest links between policymakers and private sector in our country. Dr. Chatterjee, please. Your Excellency, Mr. Tomas Kozlowski, <clears throat> Ms. Florencia Librizi, Mr. Nitin Sait, Mr. Anil Rai, <coughs> Professor Rakesh Chaudhary, distinguished invitees, students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me at the very outset uh, thank profusely the IILM for giving me this opportunity to be here this afternoon uh, amongst all of you and share uh, some thoughts, not only on the subject of uh, PRME, that management, responsible management education, but on some of the developments that have been resonating around the globe on aspects of the SDG, the COP21, the developments in CSR, the engagement with the private sector. It's suddenly a very exciting world out there. And it is such a pleasure to be a part of that excitement. I also need to reveal at the outset that the IILM and the IICA, my own parent organization, are joint at the hip in this endeavor. We signed an MOU not long ago, and this process of engagement between the IILM and the IICA is a very important pointer in the direction of making the SDGs uh, the successor to the MDGs a very mark part of the way in which we think and carry out these processes. Let me also say that the third partner, the UN Global Compact, uh, Ms. Librizi is here all the way from New York, Mr. Puran Pandey, who heads up the India Wing, uh, he and I in the IICA, we have been engaged very strongly at many fora and many platform in looking at the SDGs and seeing how best we can actualize them. Now, as you say, the clock has begun to tick midnight hour of the 31st of December last year and the 1st of January this year. A lot has been said about the SDGs, and many of you have read them many times. It's important for us not to just uh, accept them as they are, but in the spirit in which they've been drawn up. And there are, let's also understand, many trenchant critics of the way that it has come about. And being aware of criticism is, I think, the best way for us to combat it and then go forward. The very vibrant mood that Excellency felt in 2000 in New York was shared by all of us when we were drafting the MDGs, just eight of them. 15 years looked a long way down the line. And we said, hey, we can actually do these eight goals by 2015. And then came 2005 and 2010 and 2012. And as we got nearer and nearer to 2015, darkness and gloom. Because by and large, most of the world was not anywhere near. And I regret to say this, but it is true. My own nation, India, was way back. We were nowhere near achieving any of those MDGs. So the world sat together and said, all of that optimism of 2000 and a certain amount of depression in 2013-14, 
what do we do now? How can we reset, re-energize, re-tweak our goals, recommit? How do we set ourselves an agenda that's not different and yet distinct? How can we get the nations to agree on a brand new platform, set your marks on your marks, and then fire the gun again for another 15 years? And what will distinguish these SDGs when we get to 2025 and say, hey, did we make the same mistakes we did with the MDGs? That's the reason why Excellency here and Madame Librizi here have told us in very clear terms that we need to adopt a very different approach to achieving these 17 goals as distinct from the earlier eight ones. It cannot be anymore just government driven. It cannot be anymore contained to just one element of the way in which we see things. All of society, all stakeholders have to be brought on board because this is a humongous effort. 139 targets, 304 indicators, 17 goals, a mind-boggling amount of things to do. In fact, if any one of us were to you know, traverse the entire section of these 17, you would be humongously challenged, hey, can we really do this? That's the world we want, yes. But the effort to get what we want, to dream big, but to realize the dream, two different things. And all of us sitting here, and all of you students here, as you get into your jobs, as you get into the work sphere, each individual company has a role to play, every one of you. And it is in that collective endeavor that the world in 2030 will be a better place to live and work in than the world in 2016, as I speak to here today. COP21, why so important? Why was Paris so important for us, for China, for the US, for the world? Because much of what we want to achieve with these SDGs hinged on the outcome of COP21. We waited with bated breath because we knew that if COP21 blew a fuse, the SDGs were dead ducks. We'd never get there. And that was something that resonated across the globe. And that's why COP21 became the focus of attention to all of us. If that agreement had not been reached, virtually at the midnight hour, the SDGs themselves would have been sabotaged for good. COP21 has showed us that nation, national leaders across the globe can actually come together. And despite the extremely challenging and difficult circumstances in which COP21 was held, and we know the kind of attacks that happened in Paris prior to that, despite all of that, and the baggage of international rivalries, the divide between the developed world, the underdeveloped world, the developing world, the emerging economies, so many groups across the globe, yet we have a consensus. We went so far as to say, OK, two degrees is great, but we can actually achieve 1.5 degrees centigrade. If the INDCs get to work, if we can put together a common agenda, we can actually achieve what we've set ourselves to do. For that, two important things. One, the engagement of the private sector, long excluded or included peripherally. There is so much that the private sector with its efficiencies its lean, mean approach to doing things, its capacity to innovate, 
its ability to respond quickly, ably, lithely to the challenges around you. We must harness those strengths. And you students, when you get the public or the private sector, wherever you are, that consciousness that you develop, the opportunities that you have to make the difference, however small, but just to want to make that difference. Second, civil society, again, seen as activists, seen as people who hold up green flags outside the UN buildings, seen as people who try and attract our attention to all that's bad in society. Great. But how do we actually get civil society to work with governments and private sector, not against? What they say resonates in our hearts and in our minds. But they need to work alongside us to recognize our fallibles and foibles. But once we are pulling in the same direction, rather than just you know, raising flags or being visionaries, whatever that means. And that's why I bring you to the CSR scenario in India. Thank you, sir, Excellency, for referring to CSR and all the backing that the EU is giving to CSR as a concept. You would have heard, sir, that in, uh, in India, we have recently uh, started Section 135 of the New Companies Act of 2013, in which uh, companies are now requested to come on board and spend 2% of their profits uh, on doing exactly this. Those 12 or 14 goals, or rather activities, which have been put in Schedule 7 of the Section 135 are virtually these 17, more or less. And it therefore encourages profit-making private sector companies to help develop, accelerate the inclusive development agenda of this nation, of this country. The one country in the world that has legislated on CSR, just India, has done this with the purpose, the singular purpose, of allowing the private sector and civil society to engage directly with the inclusive development of the nation. That's the opportunity it provides. And in that triumvirate, in that triangle between government acting as a facilitating agency, civil society, NGOs working at the grassroots level to implement CSR programs, and corporate India providing its expertise, its knowledge, its innovation, its human, and its financial resources. And of course, academia to which you referred, Madame. Altogether, allowing the best companies, the best boards, the best minds to engage actively in accelerating the social development of the nation. It is all of this put together, ladies and gentlemen. It's all of this put together that will ultimately ensure the success of the SDGs. But if not, we will meet here or somewhere else in 2030 and lament the same way as we did for the MDGs. Let not that occasion arise, ladies and gentlemen, when we lament again and then say, ho oh, ho, we had eight, then we had 17, now let's have 34 goals. That will not take the world forward. What will is a whole new commitment of every one of us, we let that opportunity slip. We must not let that happen again. All of us, and through this great step that ILM has taken, this international conference, this confluence of minds, the best minds uh, among students and young people, let this be a pointer, let this be a benchmark, let this be an occasion when we commit ourselves to succeeding in establishing that world which we want.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for your very energizing address. I think it uh, made a strong point that this time, failure is not an option we have. We have to make sure we succeed. Thank you, sir. Our friends, now our next speaker is Mr. Nitin Sate. He's address, going to address on building sustainable cities, the power of positive personal actions. Uh, Mr. Sates is Managing Director and Country Head for Fidelity Worldwide Investments in India. He is responsible for Fidelity's offshore operations. He joined Fidelity in 2010. Prior to that, he was a partner with McKenzie & Company. He played a key role in McKenzie & Company for eight years and developed a very strong research back office into not only the largest knowledge and innovation hub for McKinsey and Company worldwide, but also the pioneer in delivery of high-end research and analytics out of India. He conceptualized and incubated multiple innovations, including centers of competence, advanced analytics, and for many new client service lines that are redefining how McKinsey and Company serves clients. He holds an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Lucknow, where he was awarded the Chairman's Gold Medal for graduating first in the MBA program. And he also has a BTEC from IIT Delhi, one of the strongest brands in India. Mr. Seth, please. Good afternoon. How are you? Come on, you know, this is still early in the year. I know it is after lunch, you know, we can have a little more energy. Good afternoon. Okay, that's much better. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here again this year. Um, you know, for the um, second time I'm attending the ILM um, annual conference on sustainable development. Uh, and it's a great uh, opportunity for education for me. Um, it happened last year and and it happened this year as well that you know, my colleagues here are certainly way more knowledgeable on this topic than, than I am. Um, so you know, there's a bit of a benefit of going last that you know, I can listen to them carefully and it's been quite an education. Um, now I would like to uh, today share with you a more practical perspective on this topic of um, sustainability, um, especially you know, something that touches all of us uh, sustainable development of our cities and you know our you know favorite chief minister has made that topic very very life for us so I'm sure all of you relate to it now after this odd and even kind of um, you know announcement um, so it's a very live topic uh, so I want to share a few perspectives around uh, you know building sustainable cities uh, which I think is a very important part of the overall sustainability agenda uh, and then I want to share some personal experiences with you. Because, you know, uh, one of the risks, you know, around this topic is that, you know, you listen to everything and it just sounds too senior, too top level, something, you know, which, you know, is maybe, you know, about the UN, the European Union, the government. Certainly as individuals, you know, what you and I can do, it's sometimes difficult to relate to it. And I think that's the challenge uh, because it's a topic where uh, individual personal actions are, are absolutely critical. So that's what I would like to talk to you about. Okay, now, why is sustainability or sustainability of our cities um, in a topic that should concern all of us? So, you know, I, I, you know, I read this uh, ranking of cities on sustainability, and Your Excellency, you'll be very happy to know that the top four cities were from the European Union, Frankfurt, London, Copenhagen, Amsterdam. Uh, what was not very pleasing was that uh, uh, you know, cities from, from Asia, from the developing world, were pretty much 
you know, the, the last in that uh, survey. If I remember right, um, you know, Mumbai was 47th and Delhi was 49th out of 50 cities. Um, you know, if you believe that one survey is not very accurate, uh, and I think this has been quoted quite um, often, that if you look at the top 20 polluted, uh, most polluted cities in the world, we have the honor of having 13 cities from India. So at least there is something we are very world class in, in which is having polluted cities. Um, and you know, uh, a couple of months back, you know, I had to give a talk on how to build sustainable cities. And I, I did a Google search, how to build sustainable city. And there's this fantastic research by a Harvard Business School professor, John McCumber, on this topic. I went through that research, very interesting. In the end, there was a case study on how, how not to build a sustainable city. And that was my very own Gurgaon. So, uh, see, but look, you know, it doesn't need uh, international academic studies to tell us that we have a problem. You know, all of us literally kind of live and breathe it every day, yeah? Uh, and if you look at traffic congestion and, you know, pollution, this is something, you know, it's, it's very real now. It's, you know, reached you know, some, you know, some kind of a tipping point. Again, if I talk about Gurgaon, the city I live in, I work in, and if you look at the pollution levels, PM 2.5, you know, it's close to 1,000, you know, 1,000 micrograms per cubic meter, you know, which is four times you know, the unhealthy limit, yeah, four times. Um, and, and see, pollution is something which has become very visible, but I think even a more fundamental issue is around water. So uh, you know, again, Gurgaon you know, loses something like two to three meters of groundwater every year. Two to three meters every year. You can do the maths. Yeah, you can do the maths. So, uh, you know, by in another 15 years, latest by 2030, water will run out. It will run out. Um, so, if you know any of you, uh, you know, have, you know, live in Gurgaon, own property there, own apartments there, very bad news. I am one of them. Very bad news. So, uh, look, you know, our, our cities, you know, have become like this magnet for economic activity. There has been tremendous. Uh, Tremendous growth, uh, but you know we are really sitting on a time bomb. We are really sitting on a time bomb. You know, more I've thought about this, more I've worked in this space. It has become very clear to me that uh, if we don't, um, you know, really take severe actions, uh, you know, in 15 years, you know, our our cities will be unlivable. Will be unlivable. Uh, you know, right now it's a battle that we are losing. It's not a battle that is lost, but it's certainly a battle that we are losing. Okay, so on that very positive note, <laughs> uh, now that I have been a Cassandra and scared you all enough, you know, let's, let's talk about solutions. Let's talk about what can be done. And let me share some of my uh, personal experiences. So I've had the opportunity of being a part of NASCOM, you know, it's the you know, industry body for IT and, and BPO companies. And I, you know, I've chaired NASCOM for Haryana. I've been, doing that for the last four or five years. And Gurgaon, again, the city I, I work in, you know, it's just really an IT-driven city. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, the growth of this millennium city has been driven by the IT industry. You know, we have, uh, you know, uh, close to a million people that the industry employs directly and indirectly in Gurgaon, so it's a very large contributor. So a couple of years back, you know, when we set out, you know, we had this vision of making Gurgaon the Silicon Valley of the East. Yeah, Silicon Valley of the East, very ambitious vision. And we looked at the growth, we looked at the talent, we looked at the nature of companies, uh, and we said, absolutely, this is, this is doable. But as we kind of assessed and as we really got into the issues, you know, we realized that there were more basic set of problems that we needed to fix. Yeah, it's very easy to have a lofty vision, but there were more basic problems you know, that we needed to fix. Uh, and and you know, as I mentioned, that there was this whole challenge of, you know, Gurgaon is not livable. It's not livable. Um, and, you know, as we really analyzed, and a lot of very bright people, and we did kind of root cause analysis and, and everything, and, and we came to a conclusion that, you know, you go through everything, and it's finally, you know, the transport infrastructure is perhaps a root cause or certainly one of the biggest reasons, you know, why Gurgaon is facing this sustainability challenge. That the transportation infrastructure is just, is just not keeping pace. It just does not have the capacity. As a result of that, what is happening is that, 
you know, we have the traffic jams, you know, we have the pollution, and we have this general feeling of frustration, feeling of despair. Yeah. And then we started thinking about solutions. You know, we talked to a lot of experts and what have other developed cities done, you know, what has Europe done, and, and, and we came to a very simple solution. A very simple solution. The solution was cars. Was cars, right? That, you know, we kind of came to a conclusion that the biggest problem and the solution is to go beyond our fatal, our fatal attraction with cars. A fatal attraction with cars. Yeah? That cars are simply the most inefficient mode of transportation. The, the, volume, the volume of the road cars take to transport a single individual is the highest of any form of transportation. Yeah? And that just has an implication in terms of you know, the, the, the kind of the clogging that happens and the pollution that happens. So, so if you have to go beyond this challenge, then you know, the answer is to move beyond cars to more sustainable forms of transportation, whether it is metro, whether it is public bus services, monorails, carpooling, walking, cycling. Uh, so that is the very simple conclusion that you know, we, we came to. Um, and, and again, you know, uh, you know, European cities, I think, have, have shown that, have proven that. And um, there's this famous guy, um, and actually, a lot of this, uh, uh, you know, thinking has also been, uh, you know, led from South America. So, uh, you know, Colombia, Bogota, you know, its former mayor Enrique Penaloza, you know, had this famous, um, you know, statement that you know, developed countries are not where poor drive cars, you know, but where it is, you know, rich use public transportation. Yeah, and I think that is really, to me, very simply, very practically. Uh, I, I think uh, something you know, we need to get our heads around, and I think is quite a key. Um, it may seem like a very simple statement, but I think it's quite a key in terms of how do you build sustainable cities. Okay, to cut a long story short, you know, so last four, four or five years, we have been trying to work with the state government on making this happen, yeah? Uh, and trying to have these top-down infrastructure solutions, planning, very simple things. Public bus service for Gurgaon. Gurgaon doesn't have a public bus service. You'll be surprised. Yeah, walking paths, cycling paths, nothing very complex. You know, we're trying to make that happen. You know, we've been trying to have a one body, integrated body, which will coordinate across this different modes of transportation. Yeah, and and I'm I'm sorry to say that you know we had very limited success. We had very limited success. We made number of these trips you know, very religiously from Gurgaon to Chandigarh, it's a nice kind of national highway, nice drive. I think we did not really accomplish much. The only thing we accomplished was that we were able to discover every possible dhaba on the national highway. So that was nice, but uh, you know, we really we did not achieve much. And I think that was a very important inflection point for us, you know, where we said that, look, you know, if we keep on depending on the government, and if we keep on depending on top-down solutions, we, we can keep on waiting. We can keep, keep on waiting. You know, we should focus on what's in our circle of influence. What is it that we can influence? And you know, we, we came up saying that we can perhaps help build awareness. We can help drive change in personal habits. In any system, there is a supply side, there is a demand side. Let's focus on the demand side. So for the last couple of years, and we started this four or five years back, first couple of years, it was all top-down efforts, not much success. Then the last two or three years, we've been trying a number of things around awareness building. We have done a number of things. CEOs walk to work, CEOs cycle. We, in fact, went on to do a music video you know, with Dr. Palash Sen from this music uh, rock band, Euphoria. I don't know if any one of you have heard of you know, Euphoria. So we did a music video. Search for it. Walk on. I'm in that. Uh, so, so we tried a number of things. We experimented you know, with partial success. And then earlier this year, there is an initiative you know, we, we launched you know, uh, three, four months back, Car Free Day. Car Free Day in Gurgaon, where I think we have struck a bit of a gold mine. I think we have had real success. Um, so this started you know, in uh, you know, September 22nd, was a World Car Free Day. And you know, we said, OK, in Gurgaon, we will celebrate that. You know, NASCOM, you know, corporates, Gurgaon police, we came together and we said, OK, you know, we will drive that. 
It is not about any enforcement, but about encouragement. It is to encourage you know, private cars or you know, users of, owners of private cars not to use their cars, you know, use various forms of public transportation. Um, and you know, it was an experiment. And you know, we were really surprised, shocked by you know, the response we got. It was front page news on, in kind of national media, and all major channels covered it, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I think that really told us that this issue is you know, becoming center stage. Given that you know, we have then, we decided that we will do it every week. Every week, and you know, this week was the 16th week, and you know, we have done it every week, every, every Tuesday. You know, we try to you know, have this car-free day uh, in Gurgaon, and, and, you know, uh, and I think it has been quite, you know, it hasn't, I don't think we have solved the transportation and pollution challenges of Gurgaon, but it has made quite a dent. Yeah, and I think that's really what I wanted to bring out. So I think there are, there are five or six learnings from this, you know, which I wanted to share with you. Um, the first is, you know, corporates stepping up. You know, Dr. Chatterjee has left, but he, he spoke eloquently about involving the private sector. And, and sometimes there is a perception that, you know, the private sector is only bothered about profit maximization or things like that. I think in this case, the whole thing has been led by by companies, you know, there are at least 35, 40 companies who are driving it, and and you know, there's at least a 25, 30 percent reduction on cars they're reporting on a on, on every Tuesday. So so there is a there's quite a thing that is happening. I think second is awareness building. I think this topic has now become a you know topic of of you know of dinner conversations. You know, people are really talking about it. Uh, you know, media has really really kind of taken on this topic. Uh, you know, we, we are going to a lot of schools, and you know, on many Tuesdays, you know, we go to schools, and I go there, and it's really fascinating. I think children, that's really, you know, where change is going to happen. Because, you know, when I look at children and the way they are involved in this topic, uh, you know, it gives me a lot of hope. You know, over the last couple of years, you know, many of you would know that, you know, there has been really this movement around, say, no to crackers. Yeah, say no to crackers, and that has been driven basically by the school kids coming and telling their parents no to crackers, right? And, and I see hope there. I see hope there that, uh, you know, there is something very similar that is emerging. I think third is great kind of people coming together. You know, it, this really gives me a lot of hope. The number of CEOs, number of, you know, uh, you know uh, people from civil society, NGOs coming together, really working together, not from a strategizing perspective, but on the ground, it's a true labor of love. Uh, so, so I think that is something you know, which I think this triggered. And I think it is beginning to happen now you know, in, our, in our society, in India. I think you know, we were talking earlier that in India, there is in anything you can say, you can contradict. Uh, you know, but you know, while there is a you know, lot that is, you know, that, that is worrisome, but I think it is happening now, that there are people who are really putting time, who are really, really engaged, and that, that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee again talked about this kind of partnership, you know, between uh, you know public, uh, private sector, and citizens. And I can see this PPC partnership happening. That's the fourth thing. That you know, often, you know, we kind of you know say the government does not do anything. In this particular case, the Gurgaon Police has been a very active participant. Has been, I would say, has been a co-sponsor. So they are out there driving this with us. You know, every Tuesday morning we do the cycle rally. You know, whether you know, our core team, whether I show up or not, you know, the police commissioner of Gurgaon is there. Yeah, so, so I think that gives me hope. That gives me hope that there is, you know, there is still you know, things that can happen. And see, the problems that India faces, and especially around this topic of sustainability, are so huge, are so huge, that government alone can't solve them. It can't solve them from a capital perspective, and it can't solve them intellectually. Certainly not alone. And the only hope is that the, this PPC model will happen, and I at least see some beginning of that. The fifth thing I want to share is about entrepreneurs stepping in. Again, that's a fascinating thing. We've been struggling with this bus service. But over the last couple of months, there are at least two large private startups that, that have come up. Ola, you would know about Ola. Ola does cabs, but now they also do shuttle buses. Yeah? There is also a startup called Shuttle. Over the last four to five months, they have put maybe 600 shuttle buses on the roads in, roads, roads in, in Gurgaon. And that has been a game changer. Yeah? There is, you know, uh, and so you would know that in, in Europe, many cities you know, have this cycle stations and kind of, especially London has that. Uh, and you know, we have been talking about that, you know, no progress. But now there is a startup called Cycle that has come up, you know, which is offering, uh, you know, providing these cycle stations to, 
to, to corporates. There is even an app-based bike taxi service that has come up. Yeah? And I think that's a fascinating thing about India, uh, you know, that you know, where the government is not really able to fulfill its role, there is private capital, there is entrepreneurial energy, you know, which is stepping in to provide, provide solutions. And, and often these solutions are more creative, more efficient. So that's the fifth thing I wanted to bring out. And, and the sixth thing is really a snowball effect. So things that, you know, it's interesting that, you know, some of these new places like Gurgaon, Bangalore, you know, they have been maybe more innovative in starting things. So in Gurgaon, you know, we also had Rahagiri Day, which I don't know if you've heard about Delhi, many places Rahagiri Day is happening, and then the Car Free Day, but it has spread. It has spread. You know, De Delhi, of course, is now doing Car Free Day, but perhaps more on a monthly basis. You know, a number of other towns are doing it. You know, the Delhi chief minister, of course, taken it to a totally different level with the odd even. I would not go into the merits or demerits of that. But the point is, the point is that there is, you start actions, and you may feel that, you know, what is really the impact of this, but often a positive action tends to start a chain reaction. There is a snowball effect. And, and before you know it, you know, it can really explode. And, and my view is that the, the way a couple of years back, three, four years back, the whole corruption thing and the anti-corruption topic you know, became a people's movement, I think we are seeing something similar to that, that I think people have had enough of this pollution, transport, congestion type of issue, and I think it is taking the shape of this movement. Okay. I want to conclude now. So in conclusion, really, I, what I wanted to bring out you know, was you know, this power of bottom-up and kind of personal actions. See, I've been trained as a strategy consultant. And, and as a strategy consultant, having spent most of my life in one of the world's most uh, so-called you know, best consulting firms, uh, you know, I was always very kind of passionate, fond of top-down strategic solutions. But you know, what I have realized over a period of time, especially with this topic, is that they don't always work. You know, it, it takes a lot of, you know, I'm not saying that you know, we don't need top-down strategic solutions, that the government doesn't have a role to do. Of course it does. But it doesn't mean that that's the only set of solutions. I think there is something very, very powerful about what you can do yourself. Yeah? Often when you have a big problem, you, know, you can get intimidated by it. You can say, oh, what will we do? is the system, it is the way things are. And I think this ability to move away from your circle of concern to your circle of influence, you know, what are the positive personal actions that you can take, I think that's a very, very powerful thing. And as you do that, uh, and I, as I said that, you, know, you can have the snowfall effect, you can have the snowball effect, you know, and, and, and there is this quotation that you know, when you really have this intent, you know, the universe conspires to make it happen. I think that's very true. So that's where I want to leave you that, you know, just uh, you know, a couple of people coming together, having this positive intent. Um, you know, I think gave Gurgaon the car free day. It has snowballed into something a lot more significant. And I just imagine that, look, you know, if we can multiply that, you know, if there are many more people who put that personal intent, who put that personal action, positive action, the impact can be humongous. The impact can be huge. And that's a breathtakingly exciting prospect. And that is really my wish for 2016, that we see a lot more of that um, personal positive action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Seth, for uh, bringing out some specific uh, suggestions to very pervasive problems of NCR Delhi. I think uh, a little bit of positive action from 16 to 17 million of NCR population can do wonders for NCR. Uh, we are running a few minutes out of this thing. Before we, I give my concluding remarks, I would like to share with you one 90 seconds video clip this was prepared by ILM students as an entry into a PRME competition. Could you please show that clip, please? A child, purest, most innocent creation of the Almighty. The happy one. The quiet one. 
the energetic one and the naughty one all different yet all the same common dreams and aspirations please police aap kya banna chahte ho commando bangalo bangalo aur kahi ghumne jana hai kahan ghumne jana hai new zealand but do they have the same opportunities and resources to achieve their dreams maybe no so why don't we provide them all that is needed let's work towards a goal of giving them what they deserve the right to be educated let us all support them guide them teach them and help them build their dreams into reality thank you <clears throat> uh i would like to invite uh, uh five students who prepared this clip to come to the stage and uh, they have requested if they could have a photograph with his excellency <laughs> navneet kaur srishti piyush garima and divya Your Excellency Mr. Kozlowski, Mr. Nitin Seth, Ms. Lebrizi. Thank you very much for sharing your thought-provoking ideas, experience and wisdom with us. Uh I think we got a lot of inputs on how we can work on these things to move ahead in area of sustainability, SDGs and CSR Thank you very much sir for being with us thank you